Welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to have you join us for our second installment of Learn From the Experts. Today, we're talking with Kyle McIntosh, who is um, going to provide us with his own workflow and view and background on how he got started on Quantopian, how he thinks about factor development. Uh, he won two of the challenges, so I think it'll be really interesting for everyone to learn about uh, his workflow. And definitely, there will be a lot of things that I will be picking up on. So, uh, Kyle, thank you so much for doing this with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's about time that we we sit down and, and talk about this. Uh, <laughs> it should be it should be fun though to share and see uh, what other authors also have to have to share. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, I'd like to start by just uh, letting you introduce yourself and talk about your background a little bit. I think that'd be really interesting. Sure. Yeah, um, I graduated from UC Berkeley last May, so been out, you know, nine months or something like that now. Um, and I studied chemical engineering in undergrad. I didn't really do much finance. Uh, the only courses I took in college that were even remotely related to finance was accounting, and that was just learning how to do accounting. It wasn't analyzing anything or uh, things that might be more applicable in finance. Um, and I did take one chemical engineering course that was related to um, project management. So it did talk about risk and beta and things like that, but more from a project perspective and not necessarily a stock perspective or a finance perspective. So a lot of what I've learned from finance is either kind of self-taught through online research in the last year and a half or so, or um, your tutorial series here on Quantopian is good, or um, I've learned a lot from the forum post too, just a lot of the examples and factors that people throw out there really helped me kind of get a feel for both the platform and some of the, the economic hypotheses that people actually have. Interesting. And uh, the programming, did you already bring that in or? Um, I got a lot of programming kind of just on my own through high school um, and a little bit in college. I, I finally took one or two formal programming classes in college towards the end of my time, but a lot of it was just motivated by data science interests. Um, I started in like sports st uh, statistics. There were some case competitions on campus and things like that. Um, within my my degree, you would do some data analysis, but it was never that heavy in the way that data science or finances uh, quant is. Um, so a lot of that is more just I've spent a lot of time with it, a lot of like many years at this point. But um, it's definitely people can figure it out. And Python is a very digestible language, which is which is great why Quantopian uses it. But um, I, I just happened to kind of pick it up over time. Um, I think I started with some basic tutorials, but uh, it became easier over time just by trying things out for sure. Hmm. And what got you interested in finance in the first place? Um, what actually got me interested in the first place, uh, my, one of my coworkers where I work now uh, as a battery and data engineer, um, basically, well, well, for one, we, we print these batteries, which is a, a pretty cool technology. Um, I have one here, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a battery and this is like a, a, a credit card and that's the form factor. <laughs> so that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, our, our space is Internet of Things and healthcare. Um, so it's an exciting space, but anyways, when I was working there and, and still am, he was doing pattern trading, just picking stocks on his own. And in my mind, that was you know something perfect for a computer to do and I went on Quantopian and I started looking at some, some pattern trading things. I've disclosure. I fully moved on from that. Now <laughs> I, I don't think it's a sound economic hypothesis, but, um, <laughs> he, it's good to get started with. yeah, he, it, it's good to get started with it, It's, it does some data transformations in the pipeline and things like that. Um, so he really got me doing that to start. And, um, as I was figuring that out and the data sets you guys provide are just second to none or the way it's accessible for everyone is, is amazing. And that kind of hooked me onto the platform. Uh, how long have you been on the platform? I think about a year and a half now. Um, yeah, I'd say a year and a half is roughly it. And um, what was your trajectory like in terms of like, so you said you started with just technical indicators, mm -hmm. but then moved on from that. Uh, what were some of the like key insights mm -hmm. maybe, or things that were really mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah, uh, when I started out, um, I'll, I'll show it later, but there was a notebook that Grant uh, Keen or Keeney, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, shared where it just had a bunch of just standard fundamentals factors thrown in there. 
Um, and that was just a great example for me to learn from because I'm kind of a, a visual learner, like a, a tangible kind of learner. Um, that was a great example for me to see just all these different economic hypotheses, pretty standard in the world of finance thrown into Quantopian's platform and how it's actually being executed and things like that. Uh, and over time, I kind of took that and some edits from uh, some other users on the platform and kind of came up with my own workflow, which is a little more efficient in my, or more efficient for me, at least. Um, and from there, I can now just try a lot of different factors. Uh, over the year and a half, you guys released more data sets, mainly the fact set stuff came out. And I've spent a lot more time with FactSet recently. Uh, I think it's a very good data set, or all of the ones that you, you've given us access to. Um, and on top of that, it's, it's well pruned with the way you guys slice the data and things like that. That's great to hear, yeah. Um, okay, well, I guess we can um, take a look at your, um, at the materials that you have prepared. And uh, yeah, I'd just be also really curious how you even go from maybe there being a challenge to then the inception of an idea. And mm -hmm. I mean, that will then take us into uh, how you test mm -hmm. it out. Yeah, sure. So yeah, today I'm going to walk through uh, three factors. Uh, part of my workflow is great, in my opinion, because I can throw a lot of factors in it at one time and just kind of let it happen in the background or I'll, I'll do something else on my computer or, or walk away for 15 minutes or whatever. Um, so I'm going to show three today. Uh, two are purely fact set estimates actuals, so like the actual reported value, uh, the quarterly and yearly values. And the other one is uh, a combination of actuals with consensus data. So uh, the first two are pretty simple. Basically what I did is, uh, for, for all three of these factors, I just started from nothing. I, I kind of had this idea that uh, I wanted to try something in the actuals or the consensus area because I know that's been pretty popular on the platform for a while now. And on top of that, um, I've had some pretty good results too. Um, but yeah, so I went to the actual site and the the examples you guys give is are, are pretty good, just showing how easy it is to, to get EPS data for the last or the current quarter, things like that. Um, but the factor I actually, or the two factors from here I'm working with are, I'm looking at how the earnings per share actual value has gone up in the last quarter so basically the slice of the current quarter and the slice of the previous quarter, how does that compare? And then I also do that on a yearly scale. And I'll show you how to actually code that in the, in the notebook. But those are pretty simple things where the hypothesis is really, if the company's earnings per share has gone up in the last quarter or in the last year, I expect that they'll continue to do well in the future. So it's, it's, sort, it's not really a momentum because it's only you know, a one, one time period, but it's, it's kind of letting the past predict the future. Uh, so those are the those are the two uh, actuals factors. Uh, the third one I'm doing is a combination of consensus with actuals, and rather than looking at the the just the reported values by the company, the estimates uh, feature I, I look at in this case is going to be the consensus for the quarter. So people also often talk about this for a surprise factor because the street may think, oh, the earnings per share is going to be a dollar fifty. But if the company says it's $1.75 at the, at the earnings call, that's meaningful. That means they beat earnings. Usually the stock bounces up for a little bit and often it can be indicative of, of future returns. Um, so what I did is I took the last four quarters of, of this EPS consensus. So it'd be basically this function, but zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. And I'm comparing that to the actuals, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. And I'm kind of aggregating all of that together to be sort of a trend um, trend following or kind of in basically longing the companies that repeatedly surprise at earnings or shorting the ones that repeatedly uh, fall short. Got it. Okay. So with, with those kind of in mind, uh, I kind of move now towards my actual workflow. So I guess back in May of 2019, I posted this uh, notebook template and backtest template. And I've, uh, the, the cool thing about this template, uh, this is by, or originally by Grant and then uh, David, who's somewhere later in this thread, uh, worked on a more efficient version of it. But basically what this allowed me to do was it was a modular notebook where you can just drag and drop factors between the notebook environment and the backtest environment really easily. Like you would just copy your custom factor 
from one place to another, and it should work on its own. Uh, the other thing with this is that it allows you to kind of lag some of the, the alpha signal from previous days. Um, I, I'm not going to show that in the tutorial. Uh, in, the, in this tutorial, I've stripped it back a little bit to something I actually use more now, which is not really lagging it in this kind of format, but worst case, I'd add you know a, a simple moving average or something. But um, this template, which is on the forums in the back test here as well, is available. Um, it's kind of where I started, but the notebook I use now is a little more skeleton of it. And can you talk more about why that would be important to lag the factor? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, one thing that you could see is that uh, certain, certain signals may be really fast moving where you only can really catch it one day or two days after it happens. And maybe that means your algorithm's having 50% you know, turnover. That's pretty hard to execute in real time. It's pretty hard for you to take your entire portfolio and adjust half of it, sell half of it, buy the other half, whatever it is. That, that's costly just from an execution standpoint and just the feasibility. It takes a lot of time to execute all of that. Um, that, that that's from like a, an optimization of the, the execution, which Quantopian handles, thankfully, because that's, that's a very challenging problem. But from a, an alpha problem, if, if it's so fast moving that you only would catch it one day, but you don't want to hold the stock for one day necessarily, you can lag it where you know maybe 20% of that signal is still there the next day, and it will keep your positions a little longer. I see. Okay, so it's not just de delayed, but it is actually staggered where you uh, almost like a moving average of the factor. Yeah. So in this it form, out. it's this form. It's more like a moving average uh, than it is staggering. But you could probably adjust this kind of template to do a stagger as well. Got it. Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right. So to the actual notebook. Um, I'm going to go pretty in depth in the code, I guess, since that's more of my background and it might make sense to people coming from a programming background, uh, from the people with the finance background, you're going to understand the actual data a lot more than I do, but, uh, maybe this will help you guys kind of figure out my workflow. Um, so I start off pretty simple, you know, throw all my, uh, imports at the top. I typically, uh, break them out like this. And this is more of a thing for me is that. When taking this to the backtest algorithm, the, uh, that template I have, basically everything below this import statement can be run in the backtest environment. All of these data imports work, all of these uh, libraries work. Uh, in the backtest, it's algo and like pipeline output. So this is just really easy for me to, you know, when I'm done with my research, I'll copy and paste this into the backtester as my imports. Um, one other thing about the, the research environment, I probably spend 90 or more percent of my time in the research environment. I only do a back test if I'm really confident or very curious to see what it would actually do. But the, the, the way I've set up my environment here is that I can get pretty close to mimicking the real back test just in the notebook. And it, it's great because I can iterate pretty quickly. The notebook has a lot more uh, statistical features with alpha lens and things like that that you can do on the fly just because you're running the code. And then um, would it also be faster to run it here? Uh, I think it's faster. Um, it also it allows you to see more, I guess. Uh, in the back test, you have to run the, the tear sheet analysis afterwards to kind of get a sense of you know, the, the sector exposure or um, the alpha decay or things like that. Whereas in the notebook, you can do it with the data that you've already spit out in the pipeline. So I, I think it is faster. Um, I. I also just like it because I can manipulate the data so easily here uh, while it's in memory, as opposed to kind of backing it out of the back test. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. All right, so after the imports, uh, I have these parameters, these global parameters. So one thing is I often normalize or standardize by sector. Uh, this is important to me just because, you know, a pharmaceutical company's earnings will not be comparable to something in real estate or just this idea that if you want to find companies that outperform or underperform, you should compare them to their peers, the ones that they're taking the market share or losing the market share to. You don't want to uh, underweight or like basically have the wrong uh, the wrong takeaway from a company if you're comparing it to something that it's not even competing in the market with. Uh, the other thing I do is I, I have this global flag to normalize uh, at the, after the pipeline. Basically, it'll take my output factors and scale them from negative one to one, which is what Alpha Lens expects. So this is just a global flag um, that makes sure that everything comes out ready for Alpha Lens um, and won't have any issues with taking the wrong positions. 
Uh, after that, I define these, these helper functions. Um, clip is basically a Windsorization. It, it'll throw out the extreme outliers. Uh, right now, I have it at the, the two and a half percent extremes. That's just arbitrary. You could do one, you could do five. I haven't really dug deep on that. But at the same time, if you rely on keeping, you know, 1% of outliers to make your, your alpha work, maybe your hypothesis isn't the strongest because it shouldn't necessarily only win, you know, on the extremes. And if it does, then there's no reason to take any other position. <laughs> so that's kind of my takeaway with the, the Windsorization. Um, I also have a standardized function. This Z scores the factors. And if I have the sectors enabled uh, globally at the top there, it'll actually Z score by sector. Otherwise, it basically says everything's the same sector and it'll just standardize there. That's neat. Uh, the last thing I have is the normalized function. This is what actually scales it from negative one to one. And all of these expect uh, just a series of data, a pandas series or a NumPy array. But this is basically the last step I do in my factors is I'll standardize and normalize. All right, onto the factors. So as I described earlier, the first two factors I'm looking at are actuals and their earnings per share over the current quarter and the previous quarter. So as you can see, my, like the factor is not that complicated. I, I know it might be more lines than if you do it outside of a custom factor, but you have a lot more control with the custom factor um, where you can pass you know, sectors and things like that into it. Um, and I really like the custom factor format it just it's more modular i can cut and paste this whatever i need to do um, save it off platform move it into the back test whatever you want so i highly recommend trying these custom factors if you're comfortable with it because uh, they give you a lot more control and uh, they're modular anyways uh, so what i did here is i first took the two slices from the fact set actuals you know one previous quarter negative one the current quarter zero and i'm inputting the actual values I'm also inputting the RBICS focus uh, L2 name. This is the sector of the company. Uh, you can go to the data reference and see there's another name that I think is a higher level sector, but uh, depending on what you want, you can decide to use this or the other ones. There's also ones that are even more granular. I've always stuck with this because it felt like the right happy medium, but I haven't really explored you know, the extreme or not the extremes, but the more uh, broad or the more granular sectors either. But I pass that in as my last variable. And what I'm doing here is that I'm calculating the surprise, or not surprise really, but calculating the percent change in the EPS over the last quarter. So I'm getting, for every stock, every stock's a column, I'm getting the most recent data point, the last row, uh, for both the previous and current quarters. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking the current quarter values, subtracting off the previous quarter values, and dividing by the absolute value of the previous quarter. The reason I did absolute value is it keeps the sign correct. Um, otherwise, if you have uh, like a negative numerator and a negative denominator, it's going to throw things off and take, make you take a positive position when really the stock had underperforming uh, or like lost EPS over the last quarter. Right. So this is kind of a, a, a sanity check for the sign. Um, and that's pretty much it. That, that is the factor. Uh, one thing I do pretty consistently is I'll fill in infinite values with NAN, uh, NAN and basically that will um, make sure that there's no issues with calculating means or standard deviations or anything like that. The other thing that I, I like about having a NAN value is the way my infrastructure is set up is that the NANs actually persist until the very end. My standardization, my normalization, they're they're independent of NANs. So NAN values will stay NAN. And I like that because it allows me to fill them with zero later when I want or when I'm confident that that's what I want to do. And that ultimately will ensure that I won't take a position if I assign zero weight to it in the very end. Interesting, right? So yeah, so by making sure that they propagate through, you remain all mm -hmm. your optionality, make sure that you even see if then maybe there's excessive NANs that will show yeah. up in the output. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's also a good sense is that if I fill it with zero here, I'm going to get a very poor representation of the actual distribution of my my values. Because um, if I fill everything with zero, I'm going to get a ton of things at zero if, if there's a lot of null values. I'd rather only see the truth, only see what's actually there. And then at the end, I can deal with NANs as I want. I usually fill them before I do any sort of combination. Um, but 
depending on what you want. Maybe you don't want to take positions in NANs, and then that's fine. You can keep it NAN and throw it out. Uh, the last thing I do in the factor is I normalize. Again, this is from that global um, toggle at the top. And this will make sure everything's from negative one to one or NAN. And that's pretty much it for the factor. Um, again, this one is looking at how the EPS grew over the last quarter. I have an equivalent here, EPS growth year, that's over the last year. And the code actually, the only thing different about these two factors is this, is that now I have sliced the year. Everything else is the exact same. I didn't change my variable names. I purposely kept them kind of nondescript because it, then it's easy for me to just swap out these values and not have to you know, update the names of variables or things like that. So this is just like, it's kind of a micro efficiency, not really, but it, it, it helps me to just you know, try a bunch of different things pretty quickly because I know that I only have to change these lines of code and everything else should be okay. Um, the last factor is the, I, I call it the trendy EPS. This is looking at the surprise over the last four quarters. So as you saw uh, before, for the actuals, it's the same uh, function call. You slice EPS on the quarter and then current quarter back to uh, three quarters ago. For the consensus EPS, it's the same structure. It's just through the period of consensus library. And I have my, my um, consensus values. Uh, I throw all of them into the inputs. It's kind of a long line of code. So maybe I should have broken it out to multiple lines to make it readable. But at the very end, I also throw in the sectors again. Um, and what I'm doing here now is similar in, uh, in structure to the previous two factors is I'm taking the actual value, the current actual value, right? The last row for every stock subtracting by the consensus value at the time. So this will basically be the surprise in EPS dollars per share. And then I'm dividing it by what the consensus thought it was. And this is giving it now a percentage change or percentage surprise, whether it's positive or negative, for three quarters ago, for two quarters ago, for last quarter, for the current quarter. And this in its own right could be a individual factors. Like this could be your factor, this could be your factor, or sorry, this could be your factor, et cetera. Um, what I wanted to look at here was ones that consistently surprise or fail. So what I actually do now is I'll add them all together. And because these values will have NAN, uh, NAN values, I want to make sure that uh, when I'm adding them together, in this case, I want to fill them with zero. And that's only because there's a chance that um, or basically, it'll naturally, in my mind, it'll naturally weight itself down if it's missing data. Like if there's a NAN value for three quarters ago, but it has the uh, two quarters, one quarter, and current quarter data, it'll naturally have a lower value just because everything's uh, combined together for all the stocks. Um, the last thing I do is after I've added these all together, I have my surprise factor. Same thing as before, you know, fill the infinity values with NAN standardize uh, by sector. Uh, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but this is the actual way I pass the sectors. I pass them as strings. You could probably pass the ID or anything. It shouldn't really matter. Um, and then I normalize. And that's it for the factors. Cool. Um, yeah, so again, why I uh, like this setup is that they're all modular. I purposely keep all the factors, you know, in one box so I can select all, copy, paste, whatever I need to do to move to the back test environment. And ultimately, it's pretty easy the way I've set it up to, to test things. Um, that's especially because of this function right here, make factors. I basically just create a dictionary, assign a name and the actual class of the factor. Um, I'm not I'm not instantiating it. I'm not calling calling the factor, but I'm just giving it the class name. And then in the actual pipeline uh, definition, I will instantiate the factors. And the cool thing about this kind of setup is that if I don't want to try this factor, I can comment it out just right here, only right here, and it will not do any sort of calculations on it. So I don't have to delete it elsewhere. I don't have to worry about it showing up. If I comment it out here, it won't do anything. Um, so yeah, I basically define the pipeline, factor pipeline. It's, you know, the columns of the pipeline are the factors we just defined. I screen it. I'm only screening on the entire US tradable universe. Um, I typically start here. Uh, if you have a, a reason to 
break out by sector or any sort of other uh, constraints you would add, like only have positive earnings or, or whatever else you want to do as a, as a filter, by all means, you would do it here. Um, for, to, to keep it simple, I'm just going to keep everything in. Uh, the next thing is I actually run the pipeline. I define a start date and an end date. Um, I think these are the windows for the current uh, pension contest challenge. Um, and I run the pipeline. I basically call that factor pipeline function, passing in my universe, give it the start date and the end date, and that'll run the pipeline. It'll take, you know, it took a minute and a half for my three data or my three factors here. And then one thing I do do, um, I drop rows or stocks that have only no values. The how equals all basically will only throw out the row if everything is NAN. And that's because I know I'm not going to take a position. I shouldn't waste any computation time on it because I know it's going to end up zero. Um, if you don't have this how equals all, it'll be like if you have it like this, it'll actually drop any row that has a single empty value. And that may lead you to um, either holding fewer positions than you thought you would, or if you if that's on purpose, that's totally okay too. You want to make sure you have data for everything. This is another way you can do it. Um, but basically for this, I keep everything that has at least one data point from my factors. Uh, I always do a head. Uh, uh, this just shows you know the first five rows of the, the data frame. I don't look at the numbers for any good reason, except for the fact that it, it confirms that I normalize things. Uh, no value here is greater than one or less than negative one. If, if I didn't normalize, uh, given that I had standardized things before, I'd be seeing a lot bigger numbers here. And this kind of confirms to me that it's ready for alpha lens, it's ready to continue on. Uh, the second thing I do after the, the pipeline is I do a histogram, kind of gives me a sense of the distributions of the values. Uh, usually there's a, a, a spike, kind of whatever bar has zero, and that's mostly because there probably is a lot of stocks that, that have low EPS surprises. I'd imagine the street is generally pretty good at guessing uh, what the EPS will be, but you see that there's, there's this kind of distribution around it. And that's kind of where I think uh, it, things are interesting because that's where you're going to make your money, uh, in my opinion. Um, the other thing is we did standardization here, so maybe it'll skew it one way or the other. If you write a, a ranking function, you'll get a much more traditional normal distribution, but it's again, squeezing everything to a rank rather than weighing outliers more like a, a standardization z-score would. Uh, the last thing I do after the pipeline is I fill NAN, well, I, I don't fill NANs yet. I check the correlation. Um, this allows me to see what factors are kind of feeding into the same alpha or related to each other, you know, correlated to each other. Um, the, the pandas correlation function drops NAN values, drops any rows that have a single NAN value. So I, I actually fill them here. I've run both of these and they spit out similar values. Um, if they don't, that means you have a lot of things with null values, but um, this is sort of a sandy check that, you know, I'm not double dipping into things. Um, even if you have like a correlation of 0.5 or something, that may be okay. Um, but if you have something that's like one and 0.8 or 0.9, you should probably, figure out why they're either giving you the same result or maybe understand uh, how to change things. Or if that's what you want, you're just going to double weight that relative to other things if you're doing linear combination or something. So this isn't necessarily like a gate. It's like it's not a go or no go. It's sort of just a, a check to see that, you know, I'm not double dipping anywhere um, and they're somewhat unique relative to each other. Uh, after, you know, looking at the correlation, I will get the alpha factors. Um, I just copy the pipeline. This is where I actually fill in the null values. Um, this is again, so that anything that was null will have a weight of zero in alpha lens, which means it won't take a position. Um, this is also the opportunity, at least in the structure I've set up to do factor combination. So you could write a for loop or something that, you know, goes at, by every date and does a combination of your, your different factors. Cause again, right now the factor pipeline the columns are the factors here. So this is this is the opportunity to do factor combination. I haven't done it here because I'm trying to look at each factor individually, because for me, that's the first step before I move it on to the next stage, which is combination. All right, next, uh, I just get the prices. This is just a pretty standard call to the Quantopian you know, pricing function. I also pad it by six months 
just to ensure that there's data, uh, like future data and past data. This just minimizes some things that might drop because it's insufficient future returns data. Um, but this this doesn't take much time to run or anything. So this is just a, a safety aspect, but it'll it'll get the prices for all dates and assets that were in the pipeline. And now the exciting part, Alpha Lens, which I'm so thankful that Quantopian has been able to build because <laughs> it, it really takes a lot of the statistical legwork out of uh, testing your factors. Um, I import it pretty straightforward. And then I define this function, get IC table. And actually this function I pulled from the Alpha Lens source code. Um, Alpha Lens is open sourced on GitHub. So I, I found the source there. I pulled this out because it was more useful to me as a single function than it was being wrapped in the, the full tear sheet uh, or the information tear sheet uh, aspects of Alpha Lens. And I'll show you how I use this here in a sec. But basically what I do is I loop through all my, my factors, which are again, the columns of this, this alpha, and I'll print out the name of the column, I'll you know, get the data and feed it into alpha lens. So you guys have probably seen this function call a lot if you've been doing the challenges on the forums. This is uh, the call that Thomas uses in his notebook to uh, feed into his actual you know, little, little tear sheet analyzer. Um, I use bins, not quantiles. Uh, it drops less data. And then periods. I do this, these uh, four values. It just, you don't need to pick these four. Like you could do one, two, five, ten. This just gives me a good sense of is the alpha, you know, holding strong for three days and then it's gone by seven? Is it gone by 14? Uh, you can play with these however you want. You could make it all short term and just do one through four. It doesn't really matter. Um, but this will give you a sense of what your, your alpha is statistically um, for these time periods. And then rather than doing the full tear sheet, which is what a lot of people would do here, or rather than doing like a returns tear sheet, I'll run this function. Uh, it actually gets the information co coefficient as a, a, a dictionary. And then this function call get IC table will actually output it as a, a data frame. And what I do in kind of the rest of this is I'll concatenate the different factors together. And ultimately what you get is you get this output where it ran EPS growth, it did its factor calculation. And right here, I loop through everything and actually output the, the IC table all together. And I like it this way. The reason I did it where they're next to each other is that I can just copy and paste this into Excel or wherever I'm keeping notes and kind of get everything at a glance. Um, I've also made it so that uh, it only shows up to four. That's about the width of the notebook. Um, you can modify that if you want. But this is kind of a good way for me at a glance to see what, are, what is Alpha Lens saying about the information. Um, I do I want really to talk like about that. Yeah. yeah, because it's um, usually what I started to dislike about Alpha Lens is just that it gives you too many plots, right? So if mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. would do that, it would just especially for three or maybe even more factors that would just um yeah give you rows and rows and rows of plots to look at and a lot of that maybe you don't even care about so here at this point what you care about mostly is just a high level overview so just getting that um uh, more succinct but also generating these plots is slow so mm -hmm. here you just get it extremely quickly um, yeah so yeah that, Th this that's really cool uh from everything i've talked about to this point if you just run it, it'll take less than 15 minutes or probably 10 minutes or something. This is a very fast aspect right here. This uh, factor data and then the performance factor information, that's a very efficient call. It's when you start doing the plots and returns and things like that, um, especially these full tear sheets that take a lot of time. So for me, this is just an efficient way to get a first glimpse of what the factor might offer. And that's where I really where I start honing in either on the IC mean or the risk adjusted mean and the p-value. Um, so in this case, the EPS growth function or factor here, you know, it says there's not a lot of information on day one, or it's potentially even negative. So in, in my case, because I have the I set it up where my hypothesis is if it had a higher EPS in the last quarter, I want to long it. Basically, if it made more or the higher EPS report this quarter compared to the previous quarter, I should put more weight into it going forward because it outperformed its previous quarter uh, EPS. 
But the negative sign is kind of telling me that maybe it's doing the opposite. And that's not necessarily a good thing. If, if you can, you know, if you have a sign flip somewhere and it's a very clear reason when you check your factor again, why it's negative, you can fix it. But for me, in this case, I don't really understand uh, financially why this would be negative. So I, I actually don't really like the signal this is sending me. It's making me a little unsure of uh, this factor as a whole, because it's not, it's not showing any sign of what I thought it would, it, or it's even potentially showing the opposite. Uh, the other thing is the p-value is not statistically significant. Um, if it's not statistically significant, that's generally a good sign. Um, one thing I'll illustrate with this growth year factor is, you know, wow, they all, they all look statistically significant. You know, the, the means are positive, the risk adjusted is positive. Um, and basically this is just the, the IC mean with the standard deviation, standard deviation accounted for, um, you know, everything comes out positive and that's a good sign. So at this point I'd say, okay, I like the looks of this factor from, uh, this information analysis. I'll move it on to the next stage of the notebook, which I have down here. Um, and, and this is, again, the p-values are significant, but they don't always tell you the full story. And, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, the last one is trendy EPS, um, also positive, you know, which tells me my hypothesis might be correct in that ones that consistently surprise are gonna inform future returns. Um, similar positive, you know, risk adjusted p-values are significant. So this is also one I would continue on with just to, to see the next stage. All right, at this point, uh, this part of the notebook takes the longest to run. And that's why I kind of advise before you get to this point in your, your research, you kind of pre-filter out things like this factor here that I'm not, I don't feel that confident about. And just kind of make sure that you're only gonna run the uh, analysis on ones that you, you care about. Um, there's no harm running the ones you don't care about. It just takes more time because um, this is a pretty computationally intensive section. But basically this snippet here, everything below in the notebook is just a copy paste from the tear sheet analyzer that Thomas has kind of thrown together for these challenges on the forums. So it's the same imports, the, the same kind of getting the factor loadings and returns. He calculates everything. I'm not going to walk through these in particular, but Basically, it spits out, you know, these tear sheets that you're, you're used to seeing. Um, the other thing, again, that I do is that I loop through each factor individually, and I'll uh, I actually keep track of the sharp ratios, these specific and total sharp ratios, uh, in a data frame. All I did was I modified the code up here to um, spit out or return the sharp ratios. Um, but basically, yeah. So a lot of people, this is where you'll want to really do your, your sanity check or your visual analysis. So again, EPS growth was that factor I didn't feel that confident in. Uh, it was doing the opposite of what I expected. And then you can kind of see here that, you know, it's, it's going negative for a while. It comes back, then goes back down. Um, you can see uh, holdings wise, it's pretty good. It has most of the, the universe. It turn, turns over at you know the quarter, which is what I expect given the way I ripped the factor. Um, you can see in the holdings, it might favor longs a little bit given that the spread is kind of skewed towards longs. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of. Um, you can typically get rid of this kind of skew if you rank instead of standardize, but maybe that'll uh, either change your alpha or not necessarily support your hypothesis anymore. Um, and that's really something you have to experience and, and figure out if that's what you want or not. Um, but again, yeah, EPS growth, this factor between the negative information coefficients, the negative information or sharp ratios and the kind of a negative trajectory. In my mind, this factor I'm gonna move on from or I'll tweak it in some way or, or whatever. But in my mind, the factor as it is right now is not strong. Uh, moving on to the EPS growth year. So this one I, I thought was a really interesting learning example, because again, this one, if we go back up, had information coefficients that were, you know, the strongest out of the, the factors I showed, all the p-values were significant. And yet when I actually look at it in this analysis sense, you know, the sharps, or the total sharp is positive, barely. The specific sharp is negative. Um, 
And you can see these trajectories are, you know, oh, it looks pretty good until the middle of 2016. And then it's, it, you know, just drops significantly and it's kind of flatlining. And this is where uh, you kind of need to look at the trajectory and the specific aspect, um, in my opinion, and not just the, the p-value and the information uh, coefficients that I showed above. Because really this tells me that, you know, maybe I had something for a little bit, but it fell apart after that. So either I need to go back to my factor and try and understand why it did this, or I can kind of shelve it for now and understand maybe in the future what, what happened. Because maybe, maybe there's a logical reason it dropped here in its flatline sense. I didn't dig in, in that much into this factor because I, I wasn't super thrilled with the, uh, the sharp ratios, but um, that's something that you could potentially do. The other thing that's kind of a, not a, a bad thing, but when the total sharp and the specific sharp are going opposite directions, it, it means you have a lot of exposure to some, certain um, factors that Quantopian has, has quantified. Um, and that's something else that maybe you can consider is like, why am I getting momentum exposure? Or why am I getting volatility or short term or whatever it is? Um, so yeah, the takeaway for this factor is the the IC you know information coefficient analysis said it might be good, but after looking at the actual full data, um, I I'm not too thrilled about this one either. Moving on to the last one, trendy EPS. Uh, this one also had positive information. Um, the sharp ratios are all positive. Uh, the sign, at least between the total and specific degree, so that's good. Uh, you will get the returns plots uh, pretty good, again, through that early or mid-May, or sorry, mid-2016 period. And then it's kind of flat again, or even on the specific end, it, it drops. Um, so looking at this, uh, it's a good start. Like, there's never that much drawdown. But, you know, there's it's pretty much no increase or even, or no drawdown, at least on total. It's either no increase or actually loses returns, you know, after 2016. And again, maybe there's a reason that it flatlines here. Um, and you can investigate by guessing or, or trying different economic hypotheses, or maybe, you know, what the market did in, in real time in 2016. And you can make your factor more robust or something. But when you start doing stuff like that, you get towards overfitting a little bit in that you're trying to correct what happened, you know, in 2016 here. Who's to say that's going to be the same thing going forward? And it really depends on how you try to adjust for this. If you just adjust the sign or do anything like that, you're, you're totally going in the way of overfitting. And that might be hard to get good results going forward. If you instead maybe understand like what the market did here and maybe you don't trade or you adjust your trading or your, your factors such that companies that Whatever, whatever companies struggled here, you adjust your factor so that it, it doesn't have that happen. If you then see like a similar trajectory in the beginning, maybe you can feel better that you're now uh, getting a better, um, not view, but basically you're, you're kind of honing in on where the alpha is actually coming from. But again, as I just want to reiterate, as you get closer or as you start looking at adjusting or trying to understand and you know prevent these kinds of things from happening, you're going towards overfitting a little bit. So you want to be very careful with what you actually do to your factor. Yeah, I think that's those are really important points. And the, the framework that you're showing is so powerful because it allows you to iterate so quickly and get mm -hmm. to that point where you see like, oh, well, that idea didn't pan out. Maybe let's try mm -hmm. something different. Mm -hmm. um, in your experience, like how many of the factors that you try end up working and how many of those <laughs> end up not working? I'm sure I have in like different Python files on my computer, you know, a hundred plus factors that I've tried, maybe even 200. I don't really know, but I think, you know, I probably only have used or, or want to use, you know, fewer than 10. And maybe that's a high percentage. I don't actually know. I, what I like about this structure again, is that, you know, I showed three factors here. I could put 10 factors and just run it and walk away or, you know, do something else on my computer and run it in the background. Um, especially up to that information coefficient point, that runs pretty efficiently. These notebooks or these uh, outputs, these plots are pretty computationally intensive. So this, I would only really save for factors I, I really am curious about, because uh, this takes, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes or longer sometimes if you have more, uh, if you have a longer um, pipeline um, to actually run. So so this is this is the part where 
I, I will run it and then definitely walk away or do something else, but um, I'll just come back. I'll see this, you know, I'll look at the exposures, look at the trajectory, things like that. Um, and what I do at the end. Yeah. So I, I mentioned earlier, I basically am keeping the sharp ratios uh, in a data frame and then I output them here again. And I copy this into a notebook or Excel or whatever. And now I have, you know, for the, I just write down, you know, what, what time period I wrote it. Um, I know what the factor is because I have the name and I have that saved elsewhere. Um, and now I can very quickly say, oh, this was actually okay. Um, but I'll also leave a note saying that, well, it, it looks, the sharp ratios look like it's not bad, but really it flatlined after 2016. So I'll leave it, I'll leave a comment there so I don't really have to save this image or paste it in or anything. You definitely could if you want to. There's no, there's no saying you can't, but I try to keep the the notes pretty clean because I want to be able to go back to them, you know, a month from now and say, was this good or was this, you know, suspect or, or whatever about it. So that's kind of the point where I get to in my research. And yeah, unfortunately in this tutorial, you know, none of them I was super excited about, but I think they're all kind of interesting in that, you know, this one goes against my hypothesis, my economic hypothesis. This one looked good from an information standpoint, but wasn't that great when you actually look at the trajectory because it kind of does a 180 halfway through. Or like this one appears to be okay, but it kind of flatlines. So they all have different little caveats to them. Um, and it kind of reiterates the importance of looking at these kind of trajectories and these um, information ratio, sharp ratio plots, just as it gives you a little more of the, the big picture aspect of it. Yeah, actually, I think this is perfect for this tutorial that they, even though some of them look like they could be promising end up not mm -hmm. looking that great because in the research process, that is often what happens. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, usually everyone likes to show just back tests that are up and to the right, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th this is just honest and um, much more of what the actual research process often looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is typically my workflow in the notebook. Again, I'll, I'll basically be in a notebook, uh, in this notebook or something, you know, 90 plus percent of my time. I'll, I'll try different factors, I'll run through them, I can, again, toggle them on and off pretty easily. And I'll go from there. Um, only when I'm confident with a factor, or at least for this tutorial, like trendy EPS was the best. So I actually did throw it in a back test. Um, I wouldn't normally do this with this factor, uh, just because, again, I the, the questions I had surrounding its performance. But what is cool is that, you know, this information runs Again, this still, if, especially if you just do one factor, this will 100% run faster than a back test. Also, it's more informative. Um, one thing that I think Thomas pointed out when we talked about this uh, before actually filming this is like, if you look at this back test, risk constraints aside, you know, this total returns line doesn't look too bad. But you can see that this uh, specific returns, this red line, again, is pretty flat. And that was indicative uh, in our, our plots that we, that we saw in the notebook. Um, and the, you can, of course, like in the, the actual back test, you know, see a little more about these things, low turnover, high correlation to the market, um, net dollar exposure, things like that, um, that make you ineligible for the contest. But at least in my mind, the notebook is faster to iterate. Uh, it gives you more information about your, your actual factor that the back test might make difficult to get. Um, and ultimately, I again, I, I spend so much time there, and then when I'm confident, I'll move stuff into this this uh, structure. Yeah, I think this is also a really uh, interesting point where if you would have started there, and maybe mm -hmm. let's forget the specific returns, we're not mm -hmm. looking at them because those yeah. look just flat, and you say like, oh, 32%, um, mm -hmm. that sounds like it could be pretty good, and maybe then yeah. you start spending more time on it and tweaking it, even though if you knew what we already know now uh, in terms of like the alpha lens and alpha decay analysis, it's actually yeah. not a good factor, but here at this level, it's just not as easy. Yeah, you could spend a lot of time tweaking your factor here in the back testing, and you're gonna have to wait a while to see all the results for all of them. Whereas in my structure, you know, I could take trendy EPS, I could have five different versions of it that I've tweaked, plug them all in at the top and run them. I can do five at once and walk away. Right. Um, just for fun, I also, this back test I showed here, I, I ran through the traditional, you know, tear sheet analysis, which gives you some of the more traditional, you know, ratios um, and the full, you know, uh, what is it at the bottom here? 
exposures to sectors and volatility benchmarks and things like that. I don't look at this very much. I very typically, you know, stay in my notebook. I'll, I'll run these, be pretty confident at some point. And what I'll actually do is in the way that all the mini challenges are where you kind of feed a back test result into this uh, structure that spits out this tear sheet, I'll do that. Yeah, I, I spend most of my time here. It, it, it's so easy for me to, you know, toggle factors on and off, cut and paste them around from the notebook environment to the back test environment, um, whatever I may need to, to really get a good sense of the kind of alpha that are, is within my factors. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, are you going to post, uh, are you going to share this notebook? Yeah, I'll, I'll share this. I'll also share the back test version. Um, they're, they're pretty much the same in structure. Really all you have to do, if, if you're happy with the structure of the current notebook, all you would have to do is just write your factors um, and toggle them on and off here. And the same thing is true in the, in the back test environment. You would copy your factors in, toggle them on and off. This function is also in the back test environment. Um, and you should be good to go to at least have a good statistical starting point for your factors. Cool. And we'll put a link to the notebook in the description of the video. Um, yeah, I mean, this is really um, uh, an elegant and fast iterative process, which I think is very important when, you, um, when you're working is you don't want to spend a lot of time just mm -hmm. either waiting on things or just tweaking things that end up not working. So yeah, this like really weeds out the things early on. You can have multiple factors run in parallel. Uh, mm -hmm. I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the, I've, I've thrown, you know, upwards of 15 factors in here sometimes and, and let it go for an hour or two and come back and cut out all of them or like 14 out of 15, just by looking at this information. So right. it, it allows me to, to kind of make sure that what I have is what I, what I think I have and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any other hard learned lessons over the years where you were like, Oh, if only I would have known this thing earlier. Yeah, I definitely coming from a coding background, the biggest challenge for me, um, well, definitely the finance aspect is difficult, but the, the documentation is pretty good. And, uh, really what was the barrier for me to entry, at least on Quantopian initially was just how to write the code in the infrastructure they provided. So the, the notebook here that I'm sharing or like this template that I posted before, to me that that was the biggest difficulty for me going forward. Because I think a lot of people come to Quantopia and wanting to try something immediately. They want to write a factor, but there's all this infrastructure around it that they have to understand uh, before. And that's kind of a gate to get through. So I, I think for me, and hopefully for, for everyone that ends up using these kinds of uh, structures, you can you can get to the factor part, the the real aspect of what Quantopian uh, is about, pretty quickly now, just by writing your factors and letting everything else be handled. Cool. Um, well, Kyle, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through your workflow. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's going to be very informative to uh, a lot of people and getting them going. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Take care. You too.